This video is brought to you by ASRock and the Z490 Extreme 4. Yes, socket 1200, dual Ultra M.2, Hyper M.2 for PCI Express 4 for when those Rocket Lake CPUs are out. The motherboard features an 11 power phase design that's going to be perfect for even the Intel 10900K, the Intel 10850K, even the 10600K, the Intel i5 6 cores. We've got dual steel reinforced safe slots. We've got a pretty good layout here, even if you've got a triple, quadruple slot GPU, it's not going to be a problem for this motherboard. It's a familiar ASRock, you know, motherboard layout overall, but, you know, with 11 power phases, the Nehemic Audio, which is based on a Realtek ALC 1200, it's a higher end audio implementation. You've got the Dragon 2.5 gig NIC at the rear I.O. We've got dual onboard 10 gigabit USB type A and type C, and of course, ASRock Polychrome RGB, so digital addressable RGB for whatever color scheme and layout you're looking for. This motherboard is gonna be everything you need for your next high-end Intel gaming build. And again, thanks ASRock for sponsoring this video. Well, I'm here with part two of Build the Better Internet of Things with Wi-Fi connected light bulbs, Hike Vision cameras, or Hike Vision cameras, I've got an Arista switch, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, let me tell you. I've been eyeball deep in crazy. All right, first off, there are some amazing smart home projects out there and there's tons of videos that you can watch on YouTube. Did you see the what's inside video about their smart home? Uh, there's a link below if you should check it out and you really should check it out if for no other reason than posterity. It's cool that the lights and the fireplace and the doorbell, etc., are all linked together. No real light switches either. It's all just push button control. It's also not wireless if you're watching that video. And anybody that's watching this video has probably experimented with some IoT thing like a Wi Fi light bulb. And it's like, wait a minute, wireless or some other wireless smart device in their life. And they're thinking, why, why, you know, I don't know. That house in that video is really neat, but you notice how there's miles and miles of wire to control all that? Some of it's ethernet, some of it's a, a two pair or four pair alarm wire type wire. Um, some of it is wireless, but most of it isn't. Most of it is not this. That is what I do not want for a smart home. This is a really high end commercial grade setup that you're looking at in that video. It's a good product, if that's what you want. And there are other vendors like OnQ that have been around forever and it's like you gotta run extra wiring and yeah, that's fine. Most of the Wi-Fi smart bulbs, smart fridges, other stuff that you may have seen or played with, well, it's crap. It's the most minor of conspiracies, but it, it is sort of an emperor's new clothes situation. People think they want this and that kind of home automation like you see in the video, and then they buy their Wi-Fi smart bulbs and uh, it's a bit fiddly or it breaks or it doesn't really work the way that you thought and then people kind of gloss over that and it's like oh no mr emperor this looks fabulous and it's like oh i totally got that wi-fi smart bulb and now my shades close automatically it's not it's not like that at all the standards to do this properly securely haven't even been invented yet if you want to do this properly to either roll your sleeves up or diy it uh you're gonna have to DIY it. Even if you go with an expensive commercial grade system, you're gonna have to roll your sleeves up and learn how that system works, learn what the components are. Decide, do you really need a voice activated sink in your kitchen? I mean, really, do you need that? Because uh, otherwise it's just gonna spiral into insanity really quickly. So for me, the sustainable internet of things, this, uh, this video series, I'm not really sure how it's gonna break down, but it's not gonna be that. I know that I want a smart security system. I know that I want smart environmental controls, things like monitoring my CO2 and HV, uh, HVAC system, how much electric, uh, electricity usage those things are using and some other heavy appliances. Some lighting control and some presence detection would be nice, but it's not critical. And it's probably gonna overlap with the alarm system for alarm reasons, but you know, there you go. And I do know that I wanna cover building your own smart devices, things like a Raspberry Pi or Raspberry Pi Zero with a PoE hat. And so if you've done something cool Cool with those kind of things come to the level one forum and show it off I think these are all topics for future videos and in the next video or the next couple of videos or two or three videos from now I think I'm gonna cover smart displays which I think are best when they're actually quite stupid uh, make the client smart 
and the network, or no, make the network smart and the client stupid, yeah. So if you're working on anything like this or something that you like, there's a link, post it on the level one forums and eventually I'll probably incorporate that into a future video. But for this video, I wanna talk about what I've been working on, just a little more cerebral, uh, and what I was thinking in terms of isolating these devices. And it's like, okay, it's Wi-Fi smart bulb, it's, it's almost okay. Can I make this thing secure? Or even better, you know, high vision security cameras. And so it starts to occur to me, uh, I think most of the stuff that is gonna be in common with this video is open source. Like open source philosophically is the most in line with where I wanna be with my IoT stuff. Like I use proprietary software, but I think IoT is gonna be far more important for home automation and home control internet of things because when you buy an appliance, you're buying it for five or 10 years. I don't think you can expect any company to support a product that long these days. Or the converse of that is General Electric is looking at what Google is doing with Nest. So they're saying, how can we get away with that with large appliances? Google made that thing obsolete in just two years. We wanna do that with stoves. I mean, not really, it's not practical, but make people really angry, but it's kind of not untrue. So open source is full control. It's transparency. And that is more important in IoT than anywhere else. Well, not anywhere else, but anywhere else in the context of the kind of stuff you'd have at home probably. With IoT, the temptation and the potential for abuse is always gonna be far too great. Remember when hackers found that the Nest thermostat had a microphone? Oh, well, that was to enable future Google Voice Assistant functionality some, some time later. But, I mean, come on. If the data's collected, eventually it's gonna leak and it might not leak until 2150, long after I'm dead. But who's to say that, you know, my data set is not gonna be an example in a mental health disorders textbook. Oh, oh, look at this guy. He's, he's measuring all of his spaghetti to the same length before he puts it into the pot. Oh, you know, you know, you don't know. You don't know what is gonna happen with the, this data set once it's there. And you definitely don't know what's gonna happen with this data set in the far future. Cloud connected pet feeders, anybody? Oh, they stopped working. Oh, you, you, you can subscribe and get it working again. Oh, we'll just disappear. You're the product folks. Pet feeding there, that was just a gimmick. So at a high level, let's look at what's under the hood on some of these, these devices and, uh, and sort of see what we go. So this is a Hikvision security camera. These are great pieces of kit, high resolution, lots of CPU horsepower. It runs Linux. So there's at least some open source stuff here. There's some openness, but not, not really. There have been, now fixed, security exploits for these, and it is still possible to run SSH and SSH into your camera and get a root shell on these devices. It's kind of a feature, it's not really a bug. Uh, the bug was that they were making it pretty easy to reset the password and be able to run services on the HTTPS port or the HTTP port, uh, and then be able to SSHN or turn SSHN on over the web. So it was, yeah, there was, there's some bugs, there's some videos on YouTube, you can watch that. Now, these can also be updated over the internet, including automatically. So here's another, here's, a, here's another, this is a different Hikvision camera. Oh wait, it isn't. This is the Hikvision clone, shamelessly branded Hikvision or Hikvision, but it isn't. And so who knows what insanity is lurking in the firmware of this camera because it's not, I mean, it says it's high vision, but it's not really high vision. You ordered online, it comes from Alibaba. It seems like it's high vision. Oh, they got a handle on the counterfeit cameras. No, not really, they haven't. And so while these are not open source, they do have a lot of useful features. You could probably, and <laughs> I might even suggest picking a different security camera if you want security cameras. But if you do use it, can you keep it off the internet? These are a perfect case study in, oh yeah, it turns out those aren't super secure. Can we secure it after the fact and make it reasonably secure? Well, that's what I've been thinking about and how to approach these devices like that. So I've got an Arista switch that can run Docker. So when I plug in a device here and use the Arista to tell it to mirror another port, I can see exactly what the high vision is doing, at least everything that's not encrypted. Yeah, some of it is encrypted, but I can block that. And for the connections that are made to the camera, because I've got SSH access, you can actually extract the encryption key or you can even upload your own SSL certificate to that. That's again, not a feature, not a bug. So with the SSL encryption certificate, I can see what's going on on the encrypted side as well. So I've been experimenting with building a wrapper based on Go, the Go language, which is actually pretty cool for this kind of stuff, that will proxy connections to these devices. Maybe even proxy connections to our Wi-Fi light bulb on a separate network, but I don't trust the Wi-Fi part of it. This type of approach is normally called a web application firewall. And instead of blocking ports, it's really filtering 
every single command sent over a particular port, it understands the protocol. And so this is a little different than what you would get with like IP tables and, and blocking a request or blocking a specific port because, you know, I don't want people to be able to SSH into the camera. It's like, oh, we'll just block that. But it turns out you can actually run a lot of commands on the web port as well beyond just streaming video, which actually is on a different port, but you got to authenticate against one other port and get a session key and, uh, you know, it's that sort of fun stuff. You know, over port 80, you can do configuration. You can set an IP address, change the date and time. There's a lot of stuff. But in normal operation, all I really have to do is just get video from this device. Well, actually, this one's PTZ, so I got to also send commands to move the camera around, but my idea is to create a simple interface that acts as a kind of application firewall for these cameras. It can send video to a client, but it can't really make outbound connections. The web application firewall will also allow fine-grained control more than just, you know, that regular firewall like IP tables. No need to forward port, you know, SSH port 22, which is encrypted anyway, and it's a little little more thorny to deal with. Not, not, not a lot, but a little bit. So I can expose only a limited set of functionality on port 80, even though at a firewall level, I'm allowing traffic on port 80. I can say, okay, you're allowed to do this command, but not that command because of the magic of the web application firewall. So I was looking at this product, it's called Guardian, and I was adding some additional rules to it for IoT devices. One big one is that these use RTMP. So I gotta make Guardian aware of RTMP type protocols beyond just you know web protocols. It works great but it's a manual process of setting all this up. This is not for the uninitiated. Well, what if we can augment this with a little bit of AI? We record some, okay, a lot, and by a lot, I mean hundreds of megabytes of normal use of these devices, and then use that data set to flag or block any unusual traffic. I can automatically prevent an IoT smart TV from phoning home and reporting some sort of content fingerprint and file names of the content that I'm watching, but I can still have access to any kind of built-in streaming like a Chromecast or Apple TV functionality that the smart TV might have built in. I can sort of have the best of both worlds. The more I've worked on this stuff, the more I think it is down to this approach. We can't just block internet access and filter ports. We've actually got to decrypt the traffic and filter everything going to and from these IoT devices on specific ports. Over a long enough timeline, these devices are gonna have unfixable security flaws, full stop. And that actually even goes all the way down to like the processor architecture. A lot of these devices use MIPS and that's a whole other conversation about compilers and tools and address space layout randomization. And that could be its own separate video. And it probably will be its own separate video. Why aren't IoT devices secure? Can't we make them secure? And it's, it turns out that we don't even have the developer tools to really make this kind of thing easy. So my conclusion is that isolating these devices on their own network behind this kind of web application firewall and no wireless devices, you know, a local attacker might exploit. So forget Zigbee or Z-Wave or the ESP8266, you know, which will give you Wi-Fi and pretty much anything. On a long enough timeline, all of those devices are insecure and making the network smart but the client dumb is really our only option and in sort of a, a wired kind of way. And you see that in the commercial solutions like the, the, the you know, the giant, bundle of wire. The web application firewall, I think, is our only hope, at least for now. But at least at that central point, you know, because the web application firewall is going to have security issues as well, at that central point, we can at least manage that and update it so we can at least get the one thing updated. Now, the DIY devices for IoT, like I am going to turn a Raspberry Pi into a, you know, temperature and CO2 monitor, those kind of conversations are going to have to wait to another day. I've got a little bit different spin on this idea for those devices. And if you're working on a project such as this, an application firewall for IoT devices, you know, mine lives in an Arista switch right now, which is great in theory, but not great in practice, then hit me up. I'd love to be your cheerleader. If nothing else, uh, we can put in some work together on this. Maybe we can found a project. I'd love to lead a team on this. I really don't have time to contribute a lot of development to a project like this, but I can contribute expertise and other resources to the project. So if this is something that you have experience in and you want to work on, come to the Level 1 forums and let's chat because I don't think the average consumer has any idea about how bad the Internet of Things is. And I think that there will be a market for, you know, an edge security device to manage your Internet of Things devices. You know, for things like SPI and I to C, like getting into the weeds here a little bit, we can have sort of a you and me conversation. The uh, 
protocol, the serial bus protocol there could make sense on a whole house scale. I mean, like the controller area network stuff, like what cars use, it's nice, it's isolated, it's not wireless. A lot of sensors already plug into that. Things like O2 sensors for my, well, CO2 sensors for my uh, HVAC system to know whether or not to bring in air from the outside through a heat exchanger and be able to monitor that and graph it with something like Grafana. CAN bus may make a lot of sense for doing those kinds of things on houses, but again, there's not really an industry standard for that. I would love to be on a fly in the wall for those kinds of things, or if you're working on a project or you're a company that's trying to do this the right way, I would love to know more about those kind of projects so that I can do videos on it, learn more about it, and actually build this kind of thing because these the little tiny Wi-Fi light bulbs, they're out of control. And you know, before you know it, it's gonna be DDoSing a hospital in Shevelinsk. I don't know. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.